On the eastern bank of the icy, windswept Baltic sits a town called Hamina, Finland, that has an average yearly temperature of just 36 degrees Fahrenheit. On the other side of the icy Baltic is Lulea, Sweden, a town so close to the Arctic Circle that on many days of the year it only gets four hours of sunlight. The rest, total darkness. What do these two places have in common, aside from weather that makes you appreciate our beautiful SoCal climate? Well, they're home to data centers, two of your favorite websites, Facebook and Google. Now, why would such wealthy companies choose to put their data centers in places with such unfriendly climates? Well, the answer is simple. Modern data centers produce an extraordinary amount of heat, which in turn requires an extraordinary amount of energy and money to cool off. So many companies have taken to putting their data centers way up north and simply opening the windows. Now, this is one way to do things. But what if instead of exiling our data centers to the frozen tundra, we can instead manipulate the way heat moves over small distances? Or better yet, what if we could turn this waste heat into a more useful form of energy? Now, the answer is not necessarily that simple. Modern electronics exist on a length scale very different from that in which we experience in our everyday lives. The architecture of most microchips is around a thousand times smaller than a human hair. And on these scales, the physics of our world begin to break down. Particles no longer have a true location, and they can begin to pass through barriers that would otherwise confine them. In much the same way, heat transfer on this scale behaves in a way very different than that which we experience in our everyday lives. In total, there are three ways in which we experience heat transfer. The first is convection, where heat moves between two objects using a fluid, like a liquid or a gas, as a middleman, such as when hot air comes out of the blow dryer in the bathroom. The second is conduction, which occurs when two objects are physically touching, and they share, each other, they share heat with each other through their physical contact. The third form of heat transfer is radiation. And this is the focus of my research. In radiation, two objects share heat by an exchange of tiny particles called photons. This exchange can be thought of something like a battle between the two objects, each firing a salvo, a salvo of photons at each other in a constant battle. The thing is, the hotter object has the upper hand, and in each volley of photons, it fires more photons than its cold opponent. Eventually, this unrelenting attack by the hot object will overwhelm the cold object, causing it to heat up. And the remarkable thing about this battle-type model is it holds on scales as large as the solar system or as small as your oven, but it will begin to break down at scales too small for us to see. And the reason for this breakdown is complex, but one way to think about it is this. Imagine you and a friend are throwing a ball back and forth. With each throw, you take a step closer. Throw the ball, take a step, throw the ball, take a step. Eventually, you'll get so close that the ball won't fit between you and you can no longer pass it, but you also won't be touching each other. And this is very similar to the way that radiated heat transfer breaks down. Eventually, I'll get these two objects so close together that their little photons can no longer exist between them, yet they will continue to radiate heat, albeit via a new mechanism. This mechanism shows itself as a very small change to the flow of heat between the objects over very small distances. In order to measure such a small effect requires a very small device. To give you an idea of just how small, here's our device sitting on the face of a penny. The device itself is rather simple, though very fragile. It's just a long silicon beam seen sticking out there covered in a fine layer of gold. And how this tiny device works is rather straightforward. Any material, when heated, will begin to expand. Gold and silicon expand at different rates when heated, however. So if I had them separately in applied heat, they would both expand a different length. However, if I bind them together into a single beam, their attempts to expand at different rates will cause a tug of war, and instead of extending outward, the beam will begin to bend. I precisely measure the bending of this beam to determine just how much heat the beam absorbed. And using this very precise measure of radiated heat, I was able to look at the small changes in heat radiation when two objects are brought infinitesimally close to each other. And the results of this measurement are remarkable. On this scale, heat begins to move in a way that it does not on any other scales. The distance between the objects begins to impact how rapidly they transfer heat. And at the same time, they're able to transfer heat far more rapidly than they could on any other scale. So having confirmed this basic phenomenon, we would, in the near future, like to begin looking at it in some exotic environments. We'd like to look at it at incredibly low temperatures, hundreds of degrees above what we experience normally throughout the day. We'd also like to look at it above exotic materials, such as superconductors, and even above materials 
specifically designed to harness this effect and even further amplify the flow of radiated heat. For the time being, this phenomenon remains a laboratory curiosity. But in the future, it may allow us to make some great advances. We may be able to radically increase the efficiency of devices which turn waste heat into energy, turning the excessive amounts of heat created by our data centers into a resource rather than a burden. We may also be able to engineer materials that can channel heat in ways we never could before, allowing us to cool off electronics without expending so much money and energy which among other things may allow us to finally bring our data centers in out of the cold.